1996, Monte di Procida is a town in the province of Naples. I went there personally to investigate, and there I met the witnesses, Luigi Caretti and his family, who made their story public. This UFO circled undisturbed over the town. It flew over the church, above the bell tower, and it flew back with an incredible lightness, almost defying the laws of gravity. According to our calculations, the object was about 30 meters in diameter. This case aroused such interest that we were invited to the Fatty Vostri TV show in 2011. This object was extremely curious because it appeared to have three spheres around a transparent central core. This is one of the more proven cases because there are more than one witness accounts. The video is quite eloquent it's one of the most inexplicable cases that KUFOM deals with. The video was shot on an old VHS tape, so the old cassettes, to be clear, those are video recorders, and they are difficult to falsify, indeed almost impossible, using normal means. Paradoxically, when we see those majestic alien spaceships on videos on YouTube, those unlikely visibly knitted spaceships, 99% of them are fake. That's why you should trust UFO centers, modestly, like ours, because we work on sightings. You should know that the images that come to us are always blurred, so there's the surprise factor. The moment that one witness, or multiple witnesses, sees something unusual in the sky, it's obvious that some kind of emotion arrives. They are seized by a feeling of excitement, so they are a little agitated, and in general, this is always the case. Of course, the immediate impact that can always lead to correct cognition, a precise deductive logic, is different. But our instinct, our solid neurophysiology at the cerebral level, leads us to not have control of the situation. So there is a natural dysregulation that can last a second for some, for others it can last an hour, and so we have to learn to manage that emotional response. On the cognitive level there's a predisposition, there's a perfect desensitization. On the emotional level, there isn't. Because there are some instinctive components linked to the cerebral system, such as the amygdala, the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, which have, let's say, dynamic natural responses that we cannot control. We can control logical thinking, yes, but the emotional response is not controllable. Obviously, today, the vast majority of people are all equipped with cell phones. The films they make are not of the highest quality. The images are not clear. They have to frame the object, that is inevitably blurred in the video, and furthermore the objects themselves are surrounded by a type of halo, and this is a classic in UFO sightings as if their source of energy makes them appear as if they are enveloped in some sort of energy field. In fact, they are always seen with this halo around them. So when we put all these factors together, the images are inevitably blurred. This is mainly due to the poor quality of the cameras on the cell phones. Poor in relation to the very professional cameras and video cameras that can be found on the market. My name is Angelo Caranante, and as a professional job, so to speak, I do something else in life. But I have a great hobby, to which I dedicate many hours a day, and that is ufology. 
This topic has always attracted me, because since I was a child, I was lucky enough to have UFO sightings myself. And ufology, so to speak, is one of those innate passions, like a passion for music or a passion for art, something that you have inside you from birth. And it is precisely this passion, this innate predisposition, that leads to dedicating many hours, above all many times sacrificing other interests, with respect to this great mystery that is the mystery of UFOs. KUFOM is the acronym for the Mediterranean UFO Center. It's a non-profit research association founded on March the 8th, 2010. We are duly registered, as by law, and our aim is to try and help to get to the bottom of this great mystery that has intrigued man since the dawn of time. Because, even in ancient times, there were many ufological manifestations. My name is Nino Capobianco and I'm a freelancer in the fields of psychology and psychotherapy, dealing with socially related activities. Engaging in social work, therefore always in function of my specialist qualifications. Since I was a boy, I had the opportunity to get to know the topic of unidentified flying objects. I was attracted to it, passionate about it. And over the years, I have always performed research in this area, until I had the chance to participate and be included in this group, in the Mediterranean Ufological Center Association. And through this center, I made some of my related research more specific regarding the psychological impact in hypotheses of extraterrestrial civilizations. It was important to make a move in this direction because I couldn't find any research on it. Also at an international level, not only in Italy. And therefore I devoted myself passionately to developing various arguments related to ufological topics. The word impact itself means what happens in the knowledge of the individual, in reasoning, in deductive logic, that a human person can perform. Therefore, impact in this psychological sense, because it concerns the cognitive aspect, the cognitive structuring of the individual, and therefore one's reality of knowledge, one's beliefs. And this impact can happen when we become aware of certain phenomena, without neglecting, for example, close encounters of the third kind. But above all, the knowledge that the media sends us every day, at every level. With the term impact, we obviously evaluate the stress that these factors could cause, related to anxiety, fears, and what happens to us in these circumstances we examine what response this impact has on the individual. The Mediterranean UFO Center has developed over time. It was born as the ufological center of Benevento, therefore as a purely local reality. Slowly, we made ourselves more visible, receiving reports thanks to our call center. Whoever makes a sighting, even without pictures, because in ufology, testimony is also very important, can contact us and we investigate these cases. When possible, unfortunately not always, we go to the places of the sightings to personally interview people and carry out surveys and investigations where the sightings happened. When it's not possible to go to where the sightings happened, we investigate let's say, using telephone interviews. When necessary, we also psychologically evaluate the witnesses to see if they are trustworthy people. And we understand this from many elements that we then cross-reference.
Regarding our field experience, identifying the first time we went out is a bit difficult, but one of the first times since the birth of the Mediterranean UFO Center is the sighting that occurred in Alvignanello. Alvignanello is a locality in the province of Caserta, on the border between Caserta and Benevento. In this locality, various witnesses had seen a strange light in the sky, a kind of orange sphere that they then filmed. There were several witnesses and they sent the material to the UFO center. We analyzed these videos and we went to the site to investigate these sightings. I say sightings because there were more than one. This case in Alvignanello, which, if I remember correctly, should date back to 2010, had such a strong resonance that on the website that we built in that period, we received literally hundreds of thousands of views. And precisely because of the interest created by this sighting, the TV show Studio Aperto of Italia Uno came to interview me and this interview was broadcast on the Mediaset networks. In this area of Alvignanello, Caiazzo, Ruviano, extraordinary things happen. A local farmer even found a circle in his lawn, in the garden in front of his villa, several meters in diameter, with strange white spherules. The soil was taken for analysis, some samples, even the grass, and they said, these botanists, these scientists who were asked, that it was a soil mushroom. But this is kind of strange, because in that area, the owner of the villa said, but also the people who live nearby, they had never seen such a phenomenon before, and it never occurred again. In this area, there have been very frequent UFO sightings. Many people say that they have even seen strange beings, and among the farmers, this is very, very common. Keep in mind that in 1954, in that area, there was also the story of a farmer, who returned home after a few days because he had disappeared. And remember, we are talking about 1954, basically the dawn of the media. The man returned home after a few days, and obviously his relatives were delighted, but they told a strange story. The first strange thing is that although it was raining outside, he entered the house completely dry. He had been healed of a disease that he had had and said that he was taken in a strange plane, an aircraft, in the sky to a strange place by some beings of very short stature. This story was very intriguing because clearly a farmer, there being almost no television, remember that the first television broadcasts were born in Italy at that time, so a farmer could not know about UFOs and aliens. And in that period, I have to say that there were several reports of short aliens, like dwarves, and similar to this is the case of Rosa Lotti, which happened, if I remember correctly, in northern Italy, which the newspaper Domenica del Corriere spoke of in those years. They told of two strange beings she had seen near an aircraft while she was going to Mass carrying her stockings. For some strange reason, these beings, close to a rhomboid-shaped aircraft driven into the ground, approached her, stole her flowers and the stockings she had to wear to go to Mass. Therefore, very strange things, incidents told by absolutely normal people. Of course, everything and more has been said about the grey beings.
But the fact that many people talk about aliens, many abductees, many who were kidnapped, many who were contacted by aliens, so to speak, would indicate that it is indeed a race that actually exists. Even though we don't have official confirmation of the existence of these aliens. However, many speak of Nordic aliens, who are tall and blonde with blue eyes. Others speak of these grey beings, having different heights, from very short to quite tall. They say they are naked, but that is absolutely not true, because these beings will surely have a suit, a type of suit that is skin tight. So this aspect is also intriguing, and we talk about many, many other races. From a, let's say, scientific point of view, one cannot help but talk about hypotheses. We have certainly proposed and asked for collaboration to form a team of experts, in which we will obviously have psychologists specialized in the various branches, psychiatrists, neurologists and also other medical specialists. Especially when we talk about neurophysiology or even physiatry itself, due to the conditioning that the person could have had. Therefore, the team would also need these professional experiences. Precisely because they are linked, for example, to the psychosomatic response to any stress suffered by the witness. Regarding the ufological investigation, it seems to be something simple, but it absolutely requires many skills. So you have to have experts in physics, experts in chemistry, experts in optics, ufologists who embrace a little of all this knowledge. Then you have to analyze the images. In fact, it works like this. The report of the sighting arrives. Once the report arrives, when it is accompanied with videos and photos, it's easier for us, because we are better able to contextualize also the characteristics of the place where the sighting occurred and understand the facts as they happened. So when this video arrives, this report, we do an initial screening. We have received so many reports since the day that Kufon was born, the 8th of March 2010, Women's Day. Literally thousands and thousands of reports have reached us. By now we are able to distinguish between the photos and videos, because for most of those we receive, we are already immediately able to establish at first whether these images are worthy of being analyzed and investigated. Once this first choice has been made among all this copious material that comes to us, especially in the summer, because there are beautiful days and people are outdoors more, we take these images and immediately pass them on to our analysts, to our video experts. We also have experts looking to see, experts in star charts and astronomy, in that area of the sky. In fact, we try to understand in which direction, which cardinal point, the sighting took place, if towards north, south, east or west. We have it sent to us, or we take the precise position ourselves in degrees of where the witness was. So we perform these checks to see if a satellite was passing at that moment, if some planes were passing, if there was a party, for example. We investigate this as well, to see if Chinese lanterns were released, if the planet Venus was in the area, or if the International Space Station passed over. So, it is very, very meticulous work. At the end of this procedure, by exclusion, we also hold meetings. We put everything together. We see the casuistry, and if we don't find the solution, we classify it as an unidentified flying object. Often the object is identified, as happens in about 95% of cases. So, out of 100 cases, 95 are explained. Therefore, 5% remains unexplained, and we classify them as UFOs, or, with the more modern term, UAPs.
When we talk about conditioning, we are also talking about stress factors, which can be concomitant or can also be causative in origin, and therefore stress produces in the individual a series of emotions, cognitive reworkings that go to determine a kind of suffering. So we must try to understand the type of conditioning and therefore the response, whether it is a function of concomitant events or a function of experiences lived in a certain period. And therefore it then becomes, it could even become a classical conditioning, in which every time not only the memory returns to the episodes or because concomitants can occur, the person can suffer huge problems. This can vary from individual to individual, from small to large structures, so certainly the resistance capacity that the person has or can acquire must be evaluated, also to remedy classical conditioning. It is clear that the history of the individual must be taken into consideration, and also to understand if there is a predisposition on the part of the individual. In these circumstances and in these phenomenologies that are told to us, I have to admit that a good percentage of people who have contacted us, who have shown us their experience, who have shown signs of being contacted by aliens or abducted and more, unfortunately it has been verified that in a certain percentage there has been a predisposition let's call it a psychological predisposition. Therefore, in that case, the operator or the researcher must be careful. But in truth, after a short period, one manages to recognize the basic difficulties that the person has, even at the psychotic level. It is strange and incorrect to generalize all this with respect to the witnesses, delegating them all into a visionary category. Even sometimes we can refer to schizophrenia. This is harmful and is not objective in our research, because these people could also be conditioned by this contact, by this formula of experience and also have had a predisposition that led them to that status. But it is possible that they can recover and safely continue their experience. As far as Kufom is concerned, we obviously have many interesting cases, such as that of Iglesias, which happened in 2014, when a family from Porto Scuso, which is about 20 kilometers from Iglesias, was literally chased by a UFO. One of the daughters in the car, in this car a family was traveling, says to her mother, an object is chasing us, something in the sky. Her mother replies, as if, and they see this object that actually looked like it was following them. They arrive home, they close the gate, and it seemed that this object made the same movements. They were amazed, they managed to film it, and they also zoom in on it. At the beginning it was triangular, you can also see this from the images, from the video they shot, and suddenly you see a whole array of lights, and it's not clear whether it was a single object or many objects in formation. It was dark, but the voices of the witnesses can clearly be heard, especially those of the children, who truly testify to the reality of this sighting. After a few minutes, this witness, the mother of these children, called her brother several dozens of kilometers away. And it is inexplicable that this brother found himself at home after a couple of minutes. Not even they can explain it. Almost a so-called episode of teleportation, of missing time, as they say in ufology. Almost as if he had been teleported from a high place. In fact, they still don't understand how this woman's brother managed to arrive so soon in two minutes, from a distance of several kilometers away. In 2010, in Crispano, in the province of Naples, some very strange events occurred.
An ecological operator was with some colleagues. It was early in the morning on a day in May, and in that period there was a so-called UFO flap, that is, many sightings made in a restricted area. While these three ecological operators were working, at a certain point early in the morning, they felt like they were being observed. They turned around and saw two rather large red spheres above them. They stood for some time looking at them, after which the spheres disappeared. That same morning, they talked about the event with several of their acquaintances. Then the news spread like wildfire, also because it was said that in Crispano there were drawings in the fields, crop circles. The police intervened, because there were a lot of people, so the forces of order intervened and cordoned off these fields, which, unfortunately, in the meantime, were devastated, were disfigured by the many curious people who went there to see what had happened. The hypothetical drawings that were there were surely destroyed. After many years, I won't tell you from whom and how, but two to three years ago, I got the photographs taken from above of these drawings, but unfortunately, after they had been disfigured by the onlookers. The images suggest that perhaps there had been some so-called agroglyphs, or crop circles, which, however, was not a wheat field, but it was another crop. Now, I don't remember which kind of crop. The police cordoned off everything. But what did the public prosecutor's office do? They seized the videos taken by webcams that were on a pole there, which framed the exact point where the drawings were. The fact is that they just disappeared, they were seized. In fact, even the traffic policeman told us, these guys from the judicial authorities came and they seized the videos. So, unfortunately, we couldn't have access to these videos. Pietro and Angela, who were also part of the Bruciano Case Ufological Center, were in the car, two sweethearts at the time, May the 8th, 2010, if I remember correctly. They saw this multicolored object in the air, a few dozen meters above the ground. They saw this object approaching. It was quite big. They even estimated it was bigger than a car. Out of fear, the couple took refuge in the car because this disturbing object was completely silent. Eventually, the object flew away and the couple got out of the car, quite scared. In the end, they contacted KUFOM and we published the video. We absolutely excluded a drone because we also made inquiries in the area. There was somebody who wanted publicity. He said his quadcopter, his drone, was flying in that area. But that wasn't true, because he said he was 200 meters away and he was piloting the drone. But it's not true, because the area has many buildings, so commanding that drone 200 meters away is impossible. The person had never been in the area. So, that was absolutely an unidentified flying object. 
I can confirm it. Empathy, as its etymology rightly states, is to put yourself in somebody else's shoes, to confront each other. The interlocutor can be more than an interlocutor, being able to enter into their problems, knowing how to perceive them, knowing how to share them and how to get them out of their situation. I spoke about this in depth in the Psychological Impact book because it is consistent with what extraterrestrial intervention is. If we reflect on the positivity of the extraterrestrial civilization that is possibly related to us, one of the first fundamental elements that is highlighted is empathy, recognition of the other and putting oneself in the other's shoes. That then, in a second phase, also becomes solidarity. Now this is a fundamental theme, not only in itself, but also one that should involve the human being in its ontology. And we often ask ourselves, regarding exactly this psychological impact, we ask ourselves, where is the empathy? Where is empathy nurtured? Where is empathy fueled? Because then empathy not only leads to solidarity, it turns into solidarity, but it also leads to compassion. Therefore compassion not in a derogatory sense of compassion towards the other, but in the compassion of sharing and therefore in solving the problem. Where is this compassion? This is what extraterrestrials ask. Eventually, they encourage us to proceed in this direction. But what is the empathetic response that the human being gives? There is a value that is very evident in those who claim, without scientific evidence, that they have been contacted, that they are in contact, that they have had close encounters. They are individuals who show another life experience, who give another form of attention to human dynamics and live in a sacrosanctly positive way. It's obvious, you'll say. There are religions, starting with our Western one, that is Christianity, which have always given this information and try to facilitate the population to carry on this discourse. This empathetic phenomenology doesn't enter, hardly enters the human cognitive structure and is a fairly emblematic situation. It is certainly not a positive sign and this should make us reflect. On March the 13th, 1997, the famous mass sighting of Phoenix occurred. But what are mass sightings? Mass sightings are sightings of UFOs by, as the name suggests, a multitude of people. Regarding this incident in Phoenix, in the United States, there were over 10,000 people involved in this mass sighting. Obviously, they tried to find a solution to this mystery, because a myriad of lights were seen in the sky. Some said they were in a triangular form, others saw delta shapes, like the formation that planes take. Somebody also said that they saw a huge triangular object, hundreds of meters long, and it even obscured the stars. Videos were shot, and aliens were openly talked about at the time. Then, this news spread like wildfire. The governor of Arizona called a press conference. It seemed that he wanted to talk about this phenomenon. Instead, he had somebody dress up as an alien, saying that he was the culprit, in order to discredit the whole story. After many years, the governor returned to the subject and said that even for him, the whole affair was inexplicable. It was said that there were rockets launched on that occasion for military exercises. It was also said that they were aircraft flying in formation. After many years, we still haven't been able to find the solution. But actually the explanations given, 
the conventional explanations could lead, and with this I don't mean that it's true, towards a conventional solution to this mass sighting, which actually could be put into doubt within the, so to speak, ufological conception. Remember that this is one of many mass sightings. One happened in Los Angeles in 1942, when an unidentified flying object was sighted over Los Angeles. All of the artillery of the US military was unleashed on this object. In the end there were several deaths due to friendly fire, the ricocheting bullets that came back to the earth. The object did not receive a single scratch and, as it came, so it went, undisturbed. Other sightings occurred in Belgium in the late 80s, early 90s, when very fast objects, even triangular, flying in front of the fighters that tried to reach them, literally disappeared in a flash, at an absurd speed. In short, there are many cases, like the one in Florence in 1954, during a football match, when the Pistoiese Fiorentina game was interrupted, precisely because of these strange objects that passed over the stadium. Therefore, these mass sightings undoubtedly argue in favour of the reality of UFOs. Their devices, these unidentified flying objects, in that famous 5 to 6% of the cases that remain unexplained, have absolutely unconventional performances, beyond the performances that any terrestrial aircraft can reach. Just consider the latest revelations of the United States government regarding the famous Tic Tac UFOs, of which some cases that occurred from 2004 onwards have been made public. There is this object in the shape of a Tic Tac, filmed on video, which from a height of several thousands and thousands of meters at Mach 20 speed, in just a few moments, a few tenths of a second, flew down to the surface of the water. Obviously, when they saw the performance of this aircraft, the US military were amazed, because even bullets are unable to travel at this speed. These objects have no protuberances, they have no wings, and they are something beyond any terrestrial logic. It seems like they have no openings, they are absolutely streamlined. And above all, these so-called intramedia objects are capable of traveling through water. From water they pass into the atmosphere, and they are even capable of going into space. Currently, human technology of this kind can absolutely not reach these performances. These objects have no visible propulsion systems. For example, our fighter jets, even the most futuristic ones, release exhaust fumes, but these objects, nothing. In order to reach this result, they probably, almost definitely, do not use combustion engines. Combustion engines that release gases that are bad for the environment. The whole world knows about the famous Seven Sisters, the seven oil companies, the seven bosses that have enormous economic interests. And therefore it's obvious that if it were possible, if this ability to have free energy for everyone were exposed to the light of day, obviously, with this system that the hypothetical aliens certainly have, I say hypothetical, but I am almost 100% sure that they are aliens, if we had this energy, obviously the whole world economic system would collapse. That's why it would put the economy in crisis, because the whole system, all the interests, all the earnings of these multinationals, of these oil companies, 
would collapse. Moreover, in addition to this, it would have an impact on society, on religion, so it would really be a devastating impact. Strangely, in places where there are volcanoes, we receive many more reports than in other places. For example, Catania, where there is Etna, and also near Vesuvius, several locations around Vesuvius, from where, strangely, we receive reports in abnormal quantities, compared to other locations. Which leads us to conclude that probably, as the Popocatapetl volcano, which is quite difficult to pronounce, in Mexico also demonstrates, these objects can be seen even entering the mouth of these volcanoes, and in this Mexican locality, several times enormous cylindrical objects have been seen entering or leaving the volcanoes. And this is inexplainable, because if it were lava material, the material that derives from the eruption of a volcano, it would only come out of the volcano, but above all, it wouldn't be an elongated cylindrical shape that enters it. And this would indicate that these are probably objects of a conventional nature, and the same thing also happens near Etna, where we have had several sightings that we have published recently, as well as near Vesuvius. So there's probably some connection between UFOs and volcanoes. Maybe they're interested in the energy of these volcanoes. Maybe they have some scientific interest. The fact is that this connection has been unequivocally established. Desensitization, as an etymological term, already expresses itself, where there is a perspective of positively sensitizing the individual to issues that have created problems for him. We can speak, for example, of phobias, we can speak of emotional structures, of non-positive responses in some contexts. Therefore, desensitization aims as a strategy to ensure that the person returns to his original sensitivity, a normal sensitivity. It is clear that the desensitization that I have obtained in relation to psychological impact takes its example from the desensitization structured not only in the psychological field, but in the clinical health field, and therefore in general. We were saying, a strategy created in such a way that the person can get closer to the phobic topic, or other problems, in a serene manner, and then refer to a correct management of that moment he or she must live. In the ufological field, desensitization aims at the same situation, in the sense that there could be groups of people, or peoples, far from this reality. Initially, in the book, I spoke of categories of people who have always welcomed the vision of the extraterrestrial hypothesis, people who ask for information and are skeptical, and people who deny the phenomenon. And then there are people, however, who, as I said, accept it, agree, and they are used to discussing problems, seeing situations, discussing, learning new things. Therefore, for those who are not close to this sensitivity, it is good that it can happen through this strategic formula of desensitization. I personally trust that governments, in not giving the many ufological centers and the whole world, humanity, the concrete statement of saying, yes, there are other unconventional realities with respect to the Earth, I trust that this non-total opening up is part of the strategy of desensitization and therefore characterizes the human mind to a different relationship than it has with the Earth. That there are formulas, there are sources, and let's say entities other than ours. 
It seems simple to say this, and yet we don't know to what extent a human person can remain not disoriented. Let's take the example of Orson Welles in 1937. Everybody knows that he launched these radio broadcasts, more than one, in which he created this alarm for the arrival of extraterrestrials. So there is this so-called urban legend that there were many suicides. This isn't true, it's been proven. Surely some happened. But from that to a mass suicide is not possible. They made various episodes and in the end, little by little, there was also a moment, in involuntary quotation marks, of desensitization. So starting from that period, many cases happened. And ufology says, the new ufology that started from 1947, although I don't agree with that, says that led precisely to desensitization. And today I believe, as I also say in my book, that this desensitization has achieved excellent results. They have finally decided to give us real information. On June the 21st, 2021, a Pentagon report was published on 144 sightings, 143 of which were unexplained. We are talking about sightings by qualified personnel, therefore pilots, trained personnel. By this I mean they are quite reliable. So 143 out of 144, one was a deflated weather balloon, which means that this is a huge percentage and that the phenomenon is truly remarkable. We should note that in regard to this disclosure, it is largely due to Luis Elizondo. Elizondo is a former US agent who even quit his job and joined a group called To The Star Academy, formed by Tom DeLonge, who is the front man of the group Blink-182. So this man managed to put together a group of insiders, a group of ex-pilots, scientists, etc., etc., who have been part of secret US projects. Indeed, this disclosure, made later by the New York Times a few years ago, around 2017, if I remember correctly, cornered the US authorities, forcing them to reveal that there was indeed a program called AATIP, which had been going on for several years, and which also included Luis Elizondo, who quit precisely because he had seen that the UFO phenomenon was not taken seriously and in the end several videos came out. And this is probably only the tip of the iceberg of this phenomenon. Surely they are telling us very little. Let's not forget that there have been further developments, because NASA has also entered the game, and within this year NASA should also publish their report on unidentified flying objects. Moreover, we must also thank Jeremy Corbyn, an American documentary filmmaker, who has contributed a lot to this disclosure, as well as John Podesta, who is a former head of cabinet of American governments from the years 1999 to 2001. Desensitization always serves to get used to coping, both with an event of that period, of that present moment, and with what could happen in the future. And so we perform pre-futurized feedback. If we are indicating, if we are bringing examples, sometimes even gigantic, contestable examples about spatial values and these unconventional, unrecognized means of transport, that too is a form of desensitization. It would be different if suddenly, in a given territory, an unconventional vehicle landed and could cause never-seen-before situations, even in the present, even with desensitization. In fact, in the year 1700, there was an episode of an airplane, which, in those times, was unthinkable, that produced great panic in the community. And they even described several deaths linked to fear, caused by fear of this rumbling means of transport that even brought, we could say,
pollution to that territory. Today, compared to yesterday, there is a new reality of openness, of central governments that communicate phenomena and indirectly respond to the evidence, to the reality of these ufological circumstances. Yesterday, it was less possible, and therefore we tried, through a questionnaire, to better understand the phenomenology of the impact, and it also became a slogan, the psychological impact, which then can be looked at in 360-degree research. So, the idea of the human being being alien to himself is a very profound discourse. We can understand that not in research, but in the evolutionary composition of his own identity, his own self, a person recovers his own self through learning and imitation, unfortunately, sometimes negative, of the external phenomenology, which is, for example, which can be social contacts, social problems, As he gradually evolves, he acquires his own strong identity, which therefore also becomes somewhat of an alien identity that others have directly or indirectly placed in his cultural baggage, and therefore in his personality traits, in his characteristics. At the same time, how could clipiology intervene with respect to what the individual should know should appreciate, should desensitize themselves with respect to extraterrestrial phenomenology. It is very simple. This ideology, first of all, its etymology tells us it comes from Clipios, the famous shield of the Romans, and therefore, when concerning ancient ufology, refers to what the Clipiology of the Romans was, who had identified in this phenomenon comparing it to the Clipias shield, therefore they spoke of Clipiology, therefore the shield, of this flying object similar to the shield. Clipiology in ufology is very important because it makes us enter a logic of feedback. We know well that feedback is the control of both the present moment and, if necessary, the past. So we can start revisiting our ontology from yesterday, an hour ago, centuries ago, ages ago, all the way back to the beginning. At the beginning, the dawn of the history of our planet. So this feedback, which then becomes specific, is no longer generalized feedback. We are here and we can give generalized feedback, asking ourselves how many minutes of discussion we are having. While in this case, it refers to what historical events tell us and demonstrate unequivocally the ufological logic in the past, in every era of human history, not just our Western one. In your reflections, I noticed that in my text, I put more emphasis on the West, quoting, let's say, in relation to the other continents, for example, the very important South Americans, but also, and above all, the Eastern civilizations that predate ours, predate our culture. So this consideration, this knowledge that the agents have passed on to us, is very important. We don't have to look up into the sky, night and day, to see if extraterrestrials exist. Our ontological feedback tells us, because we cannot consider nonsense the words written by Cicero, by top writing experts, but also by the simplest people who have told us of many situations. So the novelty that I probably allowed myself to give to ufological research was this of feedback. 
So, going back in history and studying history, we discover that we have always been visited by extraterrestrial entities. Are they confederates? Are they related to what religions tell us? We don't care. At this moment, we are interested in working on feedback and discovering that we can have the answer to our existence from the past. In the last 10 years, starting from 2010, when we also held conferences at a national level, in Rome, in Modena, I remember I insisted a lot on the feedback. Not because it was a work of persuasion, but it was my means of research, which transmits to me the subject I deal with, and therefore I can say, let's say, that in fact a myriad of publications related to the past came up. But not only. Research on the Bible, on the Viminas, on Buddhist textual books, and so on. But all the sources have been researched completely and thoroughly. The territory, archaeology, historical, direct and indirect references, as we mentioned before, Cicero, that demonstrate this grandiose reality, and many authors really came to write splendid works. And that was what I wanted. So the feedback, going back to your question, is inevitable, and clipiology is a clear example. I can even say, paradoxically, outdated, because this phenomenon is clear, inevitable, indisputable. Cases of mutilation of cattle constitute a rather intriguing part of ufology, or at least so it is believed, because it hasn't been possible to understand the origin of this mystery, especially in the United States, where people are more attentive to UFO phenomena. And this is a consequence of the Roswell crash of July the 2nd, 1947. This case had a truly remarkable effect of awareness on the population. So the Americans are very attentive to the UFO phenomenon. Great attention has been paid to this phenomenon of animal mutilations. Dead animals are found with absolutely weird characteristics. Their bodies are completely bled out, devoid of blood, with burns around the soft tissue, body parts that have been eliminated, that have been removed, the others, genital organs, etc. Now, someone could say that it is predators who do this, but this is not the case, because first of all, traces of predators have never been found, and let's say, when there are these phenomena, in fact, when there are these mutilated animal carcasses, quite horribly in so many cases, because other parts of the body are also removed, predators don't even come close to the bodies. These animals are almost always lying on one side, and all the bones are crushed where they are lying. They are broken, which means that these carcasses have probably been dropped from a certain height, and this would explain why their practically crushed skeleton corresponds to the part resting on the ground. Very often, unidentified flying objects have been seen flying in these areas, so there are some, some ufologists, who believe that this is probably the work of aliens. But for what reason? Perhaps, hypothetically speaking, they need something concerning the body of these animals, for purposes that we are unaware of. Vincenzo, ne erano due, oh, inizialmente ne erano due, si sono sdoppiati a tre. 
è sempre stati tre, ma non fanno forme strane. Guarda che cazzo stanno facendo, ma che sono? Michi, ma tu devi asciugare. Secondo te che sì, le sto riprendendo. Stanno seccando tutti, guarda, guarda. Oh, si lo spiego, si spiego. Non è sparito. Ma che è reazzetta? Che cazzo è? A me si vedono ragazzi Ma si può avvicinare? No, e eh, questi ti vengono per pazzi Guarda, una mo' è sparita Cioè, cose di pazzi però... Eh, si mo' si, mo' si Oh, no, guarda come stanno vicini quei due, come fanno? Ma si ferma, si ferma. Ho capito. Eh? Ma obiettivamente. Dov'è? Come fanno a stare quei due R così vicini? No, no, voglio, è troppo una capata. È diventato un puntino, ma si spetta. Così a intermittenza, ma che cazzo è? Ma che stai facendo? A me fanno il preso e spento. Si è spento. Poi ti passa. Vai, la tira l'altro quello.